It turns the seas are rough out there. The seas? Yeah, like the seven seas, the shining diamonds, the four oceans, the four corners of the earth that I don't know if Kyrie Irving believes in that, but anyway. <laughs> Kyrie Irving uh-huh. has just become tied for my second least favorite Kyrie. <laughs> Okay, so who's your first least favorite Kyrie? So I was out sailing the ocean in my uh, in my giant boat that we call the Golden Satch. Okay. And <laughs> I got hijacked. What? Hijacked. But like, like the pirates from uh, the, that Tom, Cruise, uh, Tom Hanks movie? No, like... <laughs> The, the, all right, so there was this pirate ship, right? Uh-huh. And a woman with an elbow pad. And like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure she must have been like a pirate princess or something. And she just <laughs> pulled over, like docked onto my boat, stole all my cupcakes, and stole the boat. What the hell? I was left, you wouldn't believe this, I was left floating out in the Long Island Sound with just a little raft. <laughs> And when you're out there, you don't realize how big the Long Island Sound is. Like, you th- think you could just float a little one this way and get to Connecticut, a little that way and get to Long Island? I floated the other way and got to the ocean. <laughs> I don't even know where we're going with that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we're going to get right into it. Look. Heart blacker than my socks. The fam waiting for that drop. Drop, drop I haven't written in a week Been double tapping like a creep it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the. Saw colors with my last girl yeah. With my new chick I see the world you know? yeah. She got me plotting maybe I should put a baby in a chick Fuck happiness, I just like them pretty and I'm thick Girl you know that I'm a Mac with it Shouldn't have to say it twice you don't have to love me. You just gotta act right. Yeah. Welcome to Talking About Wrestling for the week of September 1st. I told you guys I'd be back with another show for you this week. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Is that why you love me? I hope you love me because I love you. Okay, clearly I love you because I'm back with another show for you this week. Uh, you know, didn't have to do it, but. I wanted to, you know what I mean? Because I wanted to make sure you guys are getting what you deserve, which is great quality on-demand audio from another wrestling fan just like yourself. You know, I'm a wrestling fan. Sash is a wrestling fan. You guys are wrestling fans. We're all just wrestling fans, and we're sitting here kicking it, talking about wrestling. Um, Big shout out to Thomas Legend for letting us use his song, Act Right, as our opener. If you guys are enjoying the show, if you like what uh, what you're hearing, uh, if you're a first-time listener, or if you listen every week, just real quick, take a second for me and hit that subscribe button on iTunes, hit the follow button on SoundCloud, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, wherever you might be listening um thank you guys for you know letting me be a part of your day you know we definitely want to grow our audience so this was a week full of news in the wrestling world and we're going to get to pretty much all of it i'm going to get to some gfw stuff we're going to talk about some injuries some title vacations is, is that the right term? Vacations? Yeah, I guess so. So, but we're, we're going to talk about all of it. And, uh, you know, I got my man Satch back. We're going to play Yes, Please, No, Please, Please, Please. We're going to talk about the May Classic. So, you know, big week this week. Big week this week. So, without any further ado, let's bring in Satch and let's get into it. All right, Satch, how's it going, man? How's it going? How's, how's, uh, how's everything this week? Oh, we've had a packed week of wrestling. We have, we have, we have. This has been like a really, uh, really fun, really interesting week. Um, this, you know, we're just going to, we're going to jump right into it. I got some, I, I got some, some topics that are pretty big that everybody was talking about this week and we're just going to chop it up. da 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 <laughs> so that that's that's number one for sure. The Cena Roman Reigns promo from Monday Night Raw was the talk of the internet on Tuesday morning. So what'd you think? Oh boy, Cena came out hot. Like uh-huh. Cena is at his best mm-hmm. when Cena is at this at his best, and we don't see it too often, but he's at his best when he's in a feud. 
where he can dial up that extra level of intensity. And right. he's feuded with guys in the past who could match him on the mic. And those have been mm. clearly his best stories, mm. like Miz from this spring, right. Rock back in 2011, mm-hmm. Punk back in 2012. So getting that extra, like, fiery hot Cena. That right. is when John Cena is at his best to me. And I think they tried to bring that out this week. And guys, if you haven't seen this yet, do yourself a favor, go on YouTube and watch that Cena Roman segment in full. And then tweet us at Satch and Dave C at TW talking about. But Cena was bringing the heat really hot. He really was. And I didn't feel like Roman matched it. Roman did have a few good lines in there that he I'll did. give, but he kind of fell back into the usual Roman traps, so it felt right. like a very one-sided beatdown by Cena. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, so this is a this is one where Roman was kind of out of his league, and um, it, it's, it's kind of unfair, you know what I mean? Because Roman has not been asked to be... I mean... He has he has been asked to do promos and it hasn't worked out well. So being that he does not have experience, you know, really doing that verbal jousting in that way where it's free form and you know say what you want, I'm gonna say what I want, yada 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 type thing. I don't think he's ever truly had to do that before. So throwing him into this situation with Cena was like, you know, passing your mom the controller on all Madden. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, you know, it was like Roman can do a promo, but like Cena, Cena is a shark at this, man. He is, one of the things he does that I kind of actually don't like is when someone is trying to do their thing, right? Say their piece, whatever they got, whatever they thought of, and they're, they're trying to do their comeback. Cena will cut them off and he'll point out, you know, I can see you're thinking about it, like little things to try to throw them off. And I think that's kind of a jerk thing to do because everybody's performing. You know, everybody's performing. You don't have to try and like it, it's like if we if we're having um, if we're having like a dance competition, right? Like you would dance and then I would dance. But what Cena does is he dances and then while the next person is trying to dance, he sticks his foot out to trip him. Right, like that, 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 that's 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 what he does to try and throw everybody off. Like the big moment in his promo battle with The Rock was when he called out The Rock for having notes on his arm, and I actually thought that was a little bit of a low blow because I'm like, well, time out, right? Like, I mean, this is the whole point of this is to entertain the crowd, right? But you're taking like I feel like you're taking this to like another level by uh, by pulling back the curtain. And going for a little bit of a, of, a, of a low blow, trying to make the person look stupid. And like yeah. when Cena feuded with Bray Wyatt, and he called out Bray Wyatt for playing dress up when being when looking like a cult leader is Bray Wyatt's character. Right. So exactly, I didn't even catch that. But you're right. It's 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 all along the same lines of you know kind of crossing the line a little bit. And maybe he feels like people are crossing the line when they say things like he's burying people. But From listening to stories that a lot of people have told, that seems to be true. And then Cena always cut. And that's that's what I would have liked to see Roman Reigns say when Cena said, you know, oh, you know, step up or step aside. And, you know, everyone wants to blame me and all that stuff. I wish Roman would have came out with, well. What about JTG's glasses? <laughs> or, you know, or what about that time you threatened to break Antonio Tar- Tarver's arm? Or, or or Nexus. Right, right. Like all, all of Alex that stuff. Alex Riley. Right. And so, you know, Cena gets so mad when people say that. But it's one of those things where it probably is a little bit of, of a gray area. Like he is right. If the person was better, they'd do something on their own to – put themselves back into the spotlight, but he does push them out of the spotlight. And one of my least favorite, it's become a running gag on the internet, but one of my least favorite Cena things is his opponents gives his opponent gives a promo, and then he just responds with fine speech, and then rubs his, the bald spot, and takes out his cap, <laughs> rubs his head, <laughs> lo- walks in a circle around his side of the room, and then he starts saying his thing, totally dismissing what yeah. his opponent says. That's why... 
I don't know. That's why at some point. It's, it's either that. Hold your thought. It's either that or he'll have like this stupid grin on his face the whole time. And it, it's, it's just basically no selling whatever the person, whatever the energy is that the other person is trying to bring to them. And I'm like, to me, again, I just think that's like a low blow thing to do is to go out of character. And, you know, I'm not going to say off script because the nature of what you're doing is kind of it's like a freestyle rap battle. Right. Like you're just you're just shooting the best insults you can. But I don't know. Like I said, I think that when you just start completely no selling whatever a person's doing, I just I feel like that's like taking the audience out of it a little bit. It takes me out of it every time. So Daniel Bryan was talking either on a podcast or some or some other interview. He was talking about his 2013 feud with Cena and talking about how Cena wants his opponents to go like go low and like be hot. And then so Cena can do the same thing, because I think. I think Cena enjoys these uh, these really ins- like I don't what's the word it's Insu- not insulting. Um, I think you're trying to not use the word shoot. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I think <laughs> Cena enjoys these shoot type of feuds. Yeah, and it's so hard for him to find an opponent that mm-hmm. can keep up with that. Like Rock was good for a while. Punk was good. It's not just that, but I think it's also the fact that because Cena has been the centerpiece of this so many times, we've already heard all the good stuff about Cena. You know what I mean? Like we've already heard the things that are said about him online be said in the public light. Right. Like we've heard people say you hold people back, you bury people, you know, uh, you're a part timer, you know, you're a rich millionaire. You don't really hang out with the locker room. You know what I mean? Like you're not really one of the boys. You're closer to being uh, a guy like Stone Cold than you are to being a guy like Seth Rollins. And the because he puts himself in these situations so much, he's we the audience has heard it. So those things kind of lose their effect. You know what I mean? Because yeah. we've heard them so much. Like when Roman, uh, well, there was a part when Roman calls Cena a part timer. Mm-hmm. But we also heard Miz do that earlier this year, and we heard Miz do it better. Right. And I feel like they were tr- they were trying to recapture that and the magic of that feud and recapture the magic of Cena versus Raw. But Roman was out of his element. It's like Roman's counter attacks were basically. A little bit of a dull buildup. Then he gets to a good line. Then another dull transition. Then gets to a good line. Yeah. And I think Roman was a little bit thrown off of yeah. his game. Like, I, I, I don't think Roman prepared for this the way that he probably should have. Like, Roman should have sat down, took a pen and paper, and said, here's what I don't like about John Cena. You know what I mean? Like, here's here's how I can do it. And he should have had, you know, like three or four strong go-to points in his head that he could have just rattled off. Because I guarantee you Cena does that. Cena's not, like, Cena is no slouch. One of the great things I heard about John Cena was, I believe it was um, Danny Davis was on someone's podcast. And Danny Davis is the guy that runs OVW, the the former developmental territory of uh, WWE. And he talked about how, you know, when he first got John Cena as a student within, you know, something like, you know, within like two weeks of getting the assignment to go to OVW, Cena had an apartment set up. You know, he had he had his transportation lined up. He had everything all set up and planned out before he goes. And hearing that just sent the message that hey Cena's the type of person that will succeed in anything that he does because of his preparation level and his commitment to you know doing it in that way in that part of the process right and so Cena would not walk into a battle without having his ammunition and that ammunition doesn't just come off top of his head a smart person will take the time and sit down and make your notes. You know what I mean? Make your notes. Okay, here's what I don't like about Roman. Blah, 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 blah. Here's what the internet says about Roman. Blah, 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 blah. Here's what I think will get a buzz from the crowd. Blah, 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 blah. And he delivers them. Yeah. So, it, so here's, here's what I think is the benefit to this segment. Roman got thrown in the fire, right? So this is like, again, you give your mom the controller on all Madden. Now she can either... <laughs> She's going to get washed, right? She's going to get washed the first time she tries to play. She can choose to either put it down and never play again, or she can spend a little time getting good at it, and then one day pick up that controller. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. Maybe it'll be in three months. But one day she'll go, oh, hey, Satch, let's uh, play a little something. And she put up 50 on you. You You know, and so that's the, that's, what Roman is faced with right now is 
He hung 50 on you. You know, he 20 on you. He skunked you. He embarrassed you in front of the whole squad. And you got, you got, you got skunked. You had the pass controller. Everybody was watching. So now you can, you can fall back and say, I don't do promos like that. That's not my thing. Or you can come back with some hot fire. My guess is that the competitor in Roman, you know that Roman Reigns was a defensive tackle in college. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he was a defensive tackle at Georgia Tech. Um, and, uh, you know, I think he tried out for some, some NFL teams. And the, the point is, you know what defensive tackles look like. Outside of Aaron Donald, the body type is mostly fat, right? Fat with, you know, for, for with, with obviously with muscle underneath. But, you know, you know the line, the line is mostly big guys, right? And so just knowing that that's what Roman Reigns' body type was based, compared to what he looks like now, that tells you that Roman Reigns has a work ethic that is second to none. So he is not going to just take what happened on Monday night lying down. He's going to come back and he's going to apply himself to his promos. And the next time that he's in the ring with John Cena, we're going to see one of two things. Either he's going to have a lot more ammo to come back at him verbally, or they're going to do something where he lets Cena talk and then just punches him in the face. And if he lets Cena talk and just punches him in the face, then we'll know that they sat him down backstage and said, look, kid, you're out of your league. You can't do this. Yeah, that would feel like that would feel like a big net loss for... I mean, it might pop the crowd getting a fight in the ring, mm-hmm. but it would feel like a big net loss in, in, in admitting to the crowd that Roman can't match right. him. 100%. Everybody's going to be watching for the comeback. So, that's uh, last thoughts on this? Uh, we, are get, we are getting a main event of WrestleMania potentially worthy match at No Mercy. And in the coming few weeks, we'll probably delve more into our predictions for this and... How? What else they do next week? Because this is the segment. I can't believe this is past Braun versus Brock as the segment I'm looking forward to most next week. Yeah, I mean, listen, the, the promos are hot, and I want to see where this is going. I do think, man, I think No Mercy is a little early to uh, to kind of give this away. They've um, had No Mercy on Roman, <laughs> but I think I, I think that it is a little early to give away a, a match of this quality like this is a Wrestlemania main event main value you know generation versus generation passing of the torch blah 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 all that stuff why in the world they're doing this at no mercy I can only think of one reason and that kind of leads me to my next point there was a picture circulating online this week and I don't know if you saw it but it was a picture of the crowd at this past week's Smackdown Ooh. Have you seen it? Yeah. And the, the alarming thing about that was all the sections that were tarped off on the hard camera side. I mean, there were people down in like the very front row and it looked, you know, kind of like a smattering in on the ring aprons. Uh, I'm sorry, on like the entrance ramp side so that, you know, when they're shooting it, it looks like there's people over there. Yeah. But for the most part, that side of the arena was empty. I was like, yo, man, this looks like... Uh, TNA show. Like, remember when you know TNA was out on tour and everyone was passing around the photos of the the, the smattered crowds at TNA shows, and, and that was the joke. And I I look at this and I'm like, my God, man, this is not good. SmackDown is struggling. I mean, oh, they have. I mean, they have a lot of talent on the roster, but there's not much energy right now. Right, right, right. And so you know what I think. That is, is another – well, oh, hold on. Let's just stay on this for one second. So that's like the evidence of something that we've kind of seen manifesting itself lately, right? Leading up to SummerSlam, they gave away that Finn Balor was going to be the demon. And that told me that WWE is in panic mode because when you – the, the demon's like the big special attraction of Finn Balor, Right? And it's like the treat for everyone who's watching the show. But they felt the need to truly make sure that they're getting as many more eyes as possible to that show. So they gave away the demon thing. That to me was a red flag that they might be struggling a little bit in terms of. I feel like struggling is not the right word because they still have, you know, uh, uh, almost a million people who are giving them ten dollars a month, you know, for the WWE Network. 
so I, I don't think struggling is the right word, but something was not adding up. And then I feel like this picture of that crowd at SmackDown is kind of, that's the evidence right there, right? Like, you can't deny that. Like, the, the thing they're always talking about is asses in the seats, asses in the seats. Like, you know, that uh, JR ta- always talks about, you know, putting a butt in every 18 inches, right? Like, there was a lot of 18 inches left tarped off over there, right? So, I, Wait, is my butt 18 inches? I, we are not going to talk about that right now. But the seat is apparently 18 inches. Uh, all right, this really pains me to say as a fan of both Jinder and Nakamura. But I think it starts at the top because I love Jinder. I want to see him succeed, but I can see how the story is kind of boring to a lot of... How Jinder as champion has been boring to a lot of people. And the title matches, while not terrible, are not at the caliber of what Raw has been putting out with Joe versus Lesnar with the Ooh. Fatal 4-Way. And... Nakamura Nakamura is skating by on pure charisma, which is amazing because he doesn't speak English. Right. But I feel like the SmackDown audience hasn't embraced Nakamura to the degree that I guess the NXT audience did because the NXT audience knew who mm-hmm. Nakamura was. In fact, I think so... I'd, wage, I'd go as far as to say that the Nakamura fans right now are mostly because we knew wh- who he was before he came to SmackDown. Right. And I don't know how much he's engaged the SmackDown audience. Or I, at least I don't know how much he's engaged them when he's not paired with AJ Styles or Kevin Owens. Right. AJ, I think the title picture of SmackDown would be much better if AJ or Kevin Owens were champion. But right now they're doing their thing in the United States title, which makes that look like which makes that look like a more interesting deal. However, I'm kind of tired of their feud. It's Very been going much. on since WrestleMania since after WrestleMania. I think after alright, we'll get to this later in one of my pleases. I think after Hell in a Cell, we need to start, we need to shake up the title picture and put AJ in there. Right. Okay. So that's going to move me along to <clears throat> my next quick hit point that I want to talk about. And that is all the dead people on SmackDown. Wait, like The Undertaker? No, not like The Undertaker, like Dolph Ziggler, like oh. Ty Dillinger, who came out, f- who answered the U.S. Open Challenge and was promptly beaten in about two minutes, well, maybe even less. I was hoping he would last Ten. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, what was it? Aiden English, Dolph Ziggler, Breezango. Breezango has their own segment, and I, you know some people like that fashion files thing, but to me, it's deader than dead. I, I just, I'm not enjoying it at all. And the travesty of it all, Mike and Maria Kanellis. I think you know those guys. Th- that's just a collection of people on SmackDown who get little to no response from the crowd. They are like. On life, Dolph Ziggler, I would say, is on life support. He looks to be doing something where he's kind of, you know, pulling back the curtain with some of his gripes, which he's been doing for a long time. But for the most part, I'm not sure people care anymore. But he does have my attention to see what he's going to do. But everybody else I named, I mean, man, like, it's like they're just there. Well, I think part of this goes two ways. Like, you can't get a reaction unt- unless you're prominently featured. And these guys aren't prominent. Like, they they get, like, maybe two minutes every other episode right. to do something. Or they're thrown into a tag match. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't feel like anybody's pushing ahead. Like, SmackDown hasn't given us a reason to care. Right. I will say... I will put Brizongo ahead of them because at least they have a consistent spot on the show every week. You're right. It's corny, and, I, and I'm and i not a fan of it, but you're right. At least it is a consistent spot on the show every week. The one... Now, I'm a big... Now, I'm a Fashion Files guy. guy. I've been pulled over for, and given tickets, but I will say <laughs> that it, they feel like they're disjointed from the rest of the tag division right. because we only see them... It's the, it's the double-edged sword. They're on the show every week in their segments, but that's the only time we see them, and we never see them actually fighting the Usos or fighting somebody else in the division. Right, exactly. So, you know, I don't know, man. These guys, they, they've got to figure something out with all these dead people because that is definitely a big reason for, you know, what we said. This connects to that picture, and SmackDown can't be doing well at the box office. Um, man, what you happened know, to they, SmackDown? They are, you know, I hate to say it, man, but, like, they might even ruin Bobby Roode. 
they had Bobby Roode coming out smiling all the way down the down the aisle, and I'm like, dude, like this isn't the character, man. This is not that the, the smiling does not fit with the whole glorious thing, right? That's somebody who's completely full of themselves. That's a heel, right? Yeah. That's a heel, and. I, they got this guy coming out doing the smile and strut, and I'm like, this just doesn't fit, man. This isn't natural. They're going to mess around, and they're going to kill Bobby Roode, and he's going to be in the graveyard right next to Ty freaking Dillinger. <laughs> All right. All right. So those are some of the hot topics from WWE this week. Now it's time to do what we came to do, and that's play America's favorite game. Yes, please. No, please. Please, please. Woo! All right, Satch, it's been a really fun week in wrestling, as we talked about already. What did you love? What did you see in the world of WWE this week that has you saying, yes, please? So my yes, please, this week goes to the first round of the May Young Classic. Now, the first four episodes comprising the first round of the tournament dropped on WWE Network this week, and they have been must-watch viewing for me because WWE has not... Before NXT, WWE had a very poor uh, reputation with women's wrestling, mm-hmm. and there were a lot of talented people on in other companies in Japan and in the Indies who never got a chance, and now WWE brought in 32 of them mm-hmm. to compete it out for a tournament, and uh, this has been, like, first of all, before I give you my impressions, I'm going to tell you the challenge ahead of WWE. They had to kind of put over 32 different people and make me understand who they are and what they're about. And And as we see from SmackDown, they have trouble putting over one person. Oh! All right. (laughs) And to buy into their gimmick all in a very short span. And I feel like they've done that with the video video hype packages before the match. And also in the match, even though I don't know who anyone is, you can tell who's the face and the heel in in the matches. Uh, a few names that have stuck out to me are, a few names that have stuck stuck out to me are Kyrie Sane, Abby Lath, Jazzy Gabbert, uh, Candice LeRae, who you may know, who you may know as Johnny Garga- Gargano's wife, who's has a reputation on the internet for um, intergender matches and a finisher that I can't name on the air. <laughs> I feel like. I feel like there's been a. Uh, I feel like there's a little bit of a struggle there adjusting to WWE style because yeah. her matches she's used to being ragdolled around okay. and then like popping out that finisher. Uh-huh. So I f- feel like maybe a little bit more of a work in progress. Mia Yim has impressed me. She's uh, got a Taekwondo background. Shayna Baszler, who you may remember from UFC or from The Ultimate Fighter, she's close friends with Ronda Rousey and that group. Uh huh. Uh, some of the others that have caught my attention. Oh, you may remember Serena Deeb from the Straight Edge Society. Yeah, I always thought she was really good looking, actually. <laughs> now she's got hair, and <laughs> and believe it. Bonus. Or not, now she's got hair, and she's got the baby face. I turned my life around gimmick, which. Oh. Funny enough, feels like a natural second part to the right. Straight Edge Society. Absolutely, that's actually, When she got yeah. fired for drinking yeah. on, off the job. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so I, I really hope they call her up to the main roster because right. they have a built-in storyline there. And also gives me a fun fact. All three of the other members of the Straight Edge, Straight Edge Society have been in WWE in 2017, except CM Punk. Oh. But we won't be seeing him in the May Young tournament. Right. <laughs> uh, they, have, they have a talented roster, mm-hmm. and this has, been, this has been the highlight of my week for me. as uh, The highlight of my week for me, seeing all the action and all the different styles and interesting characters interact. And... I know they can't sign all of these women to NXT, right? but there were about 10 or 12 or so that I could easily see of being signed or going to the main roster. Nice. So I haven't had a chance to <clears throat> to dig into the May Classic yet, um, but I really I, I have to because Brian is going to kill me if I don't. Shout out to my man Brian H. Waters. I had him on the show to talk about the May Classic once it got uh, once it was announced that this is going to be a thing, and he really he really got me excited for some of these performers that are going to come up. So I haven't had a chance to watch any of it yet, but I definitely plan to, to 
dig in and watch it. It looks really interesting for all the reasons that you were just naming. And be- before you start, before you dive into it, I want to give you one name that I think you're going to enjoy her matches. Uh-oh. Tony Storm. Tony Storm. Uh, I saw a little preview of Tony Storm and her what? Hip attacks? The uh, gyra- <laughs> the uh, circular motion hip rear thrust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. I love yo. Stuff like that is really eye catching, man. I'm a big fan of um you know, there's so many things that have been done in wrestling, right? Like over and over and over, like nothing's new. And so especially when you're, you know, like on an, on the indies, you don't have a story that people are following, you know? So you have to have a character, um, a performance, and a move set that is going to get people's attention for that one time that they see you. And stuff like that is a great example of, you know, why it's great to bring in people who have that experience out on the indies. And for you, those of you at home, I'm going to throw out three matches that I think were my top matches of the week. It would be... Jazzy Gabbard versus Abby Lath, Zeta versus Shayna Baszler, and Kyrie Sane versus Tessa Blanchard. All right, so guys, tweet us oh. your thoughts about the May Young tournament at Satch and Dave C at TW Talking About. We'd love to read your feedback on the air. Yay, yay. So that was a great yes, please, Satch. The May Classic is a big, big deal. And so, in honor of the May Young Classic, I am going to do all female. Yes, please, no, please, and please, please. All my pleases today are going to center around female members of the WWE roster. Because we're not like most podcasters. (laughs) That's right. And so my yes, please this week goes to the combination of Lana and Tamina. So I I love this combination. I think it's really good for both people for a multitude of reasons. For one... I just I, I like where this is going. You know, it, it, you you got Lana as the you know I'll lead you to the promised land type person, and Tamina is someone who has so much potential, but we've never got a chance to see it materialize because she seems to have uh, a bit of a shell. And even though she's a performer, right in front of thousands of people for years now, she rarely actually comes out of her shell. They rarely give her a speaking role and a chance to really, you know, kind of show her personality. And I think this will give her a chance to kind of show some part of her personality. And so I I love that. And we always love giving someone new a chance, right? In wrestling, we're a big fan of something or someone new. Let's see what they're bringing to the table. And Tamina is not new because she's been there for a long time, but Whatever she's going to be doing is going to feel new to us because they haven't really let her do anything, right? Like, the last close to interesting thing she did was in Team Bad, and that was just, she was just like the strong, silent one, you know, like she would just say something here or there. My favorite was when they gave Sasha and Naomi adjectives, like Sasha's the fierce one, or Naomi's (laughs) the strong one, and then they didn't have one for Tamina. Yeah, and there's Tamina. (laughs) <laughs> All right. And so exactly. And so I feel like this is just this is a twosome. And so they're going to be directly playing off each other. And so I just I, I think this is great. We're going to get a chance to really see Tamina Blossom. Now, um, I also think this is the best role for Lana. Lana is dope, right? Like she's very talented. She can do a lot of things, but she has not mastered her wrestling performance, right? Like the Russian accent is a little shaky. The wrestling is, uh, you know, I mean, like, but she's someone who you do enjoy. She has some presence, right? She has some presence. She's over with the crowd. Yes. Well, that's because she's a good-looking woman. I mean, well, that's, that's a big part I guess that's right? – well, I didn't want to say it, but that's why she's – Yes. So, you know, I, but hey, you know, like you've got that, use it, right? And in this, this is very similar to the role she was doing with Rusev. She's the she's the, the ravishing manager, right? So it's, she's a good-looking woman, right? I mean, that, that's what it is. Um, but this is a good role for her. You know, like let her play – and I think, too – by having her next to Tamina, does that take some of her sexuality out of, out of it? Because she's not, like, next to a man, right? If it's women managing women going against women, does that eliminate the sexual element to it? Um, because she's not, like, a play object on the outside. Not that she was that with Rusev, but you see Rusev, and he's this big hulking man, and the 
uh, she's the opposite, right? She's the opposite. She's, you know, you don't want Rusev next to you. You want her next to you, right? I mean, I kind of want to see it run for a few weeks more before I can make a judgment. I mean, it could or it couldn't. Like, this is one where I want to see where this, they take the story. Definitely. 100%. Um, but I like these roles. I like these roles. I think these are good roles for both of these uh, women. And I'm just interested to see where it goes. So, you know, right now I'm interested and I'm intrigued to see what happens. So, Lana and Tamina, you get my yes, please. All right, Satch. So, we heard what you like, the May Classic. But we know not everything can be a winner, right? So what didn't you like this week? What did you see in the world of WWE that has you saying no, please? All right, my no, please. We touched on this a little bit earlier in the show. Is the end of SmackDown when Randy Orton RKO's uh, Shinsuke Nakamura. So I don't really... I'm not that hyped for either of them in getting the rematch at Hell in a Cell. But I'm even less hyped for Randy Orton because he's had three matches, Mm -hmm. and uh, the second one was better than the first. The first one had the shocking moment. The third one was the Punjabi prison, which we don't need to see for a while. I'm not that excited to see him feuding with Jinder because they have really no chemistry together. It's just Jinder talking at the crowd, Randy talking at the crowd about what he's going to do to Jinder, and they have no mesh together. Meanwhile, I don't feel... I think Orton and Nakamura could have a good match together, Mm -hmm. but I don't feel like either of them could have a good feud with each other because it would just be Orton talking about how I'm the snake and I'm going to RK you out of nowhere (laughs) and Nakamura doing the long entrance and then doing a pose at Orton. So I feel like they wouldn't mesh well. And this is a problem with a lot of Orton feuds for me is that he doesn't have that much chemistry with a lot of people. Mm. He's not a good baby face unless he has the story. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not a good baby face unless he's against an even better heel like Seth Rollins in right. 2015. And as a heel, it feels like we've all, we've see, seen everything already from Randy Orton. So my no, please, please keep Randy Orton out of the SmackDown title picture. Ah, okay. Uh, you know what? See, so I kind of... I'm kind of on the opposite from you with that. Like, I really liked the RKO to end the show. It was like a nice little surprise because uh, the mat- the tag team match itself, I was not interested in. You know, I-, I just wasn't interested in the way it was playing out. It just, it felt like filler, right? And then you have Randy Orton, RKO, Nakamura at the end of the match. And I'm like, okay, well now they have a reason to fight, right? Like, I mean... The opportunity to become the next challenger for the world title is a reason to fight, but now you got a little animosity, right? Because you cheap shot at me, you snuck me, we just won a match, I thought we were cool, and then you did that bullshit, right? So um, so now, I think this adds an element to their match next week. It makes me say, okay, I want to see how Nakamura is going to come back. And it puts Randy, if even briefly, into the heel role, and that's the role that he's great at. I watched Randy Orton flounder to me, not to WWE, obviously, but to me, in my opinion, he floundered. He just never impressed me until he came back from the injury. He had the sleeve tattoos, and it's just just like a, 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 a switch. It's like he, he hit a switch. I think this is when he did the thing where he DDT'd Stephanie off the ropes mm. and, and uh, handcuffed Triple H and kissed her right there in the ring. And I was like, that's when Randy Orton hit another level for me when he started doing that character. But before that, you know, it just it wasn't connecting with me. But evil Randy is the best Randy. You know what I mean? Like, he's that's when he's great. That's when he's at his best. And so having him do the sneak attack on Nakamura at the end of the match... I think that that put him in the space where he's comfortable and where we're comfortable seeing him. Okay, and my prediction for the match, I think they know we're expecting to see a uh, Kinshasa countered into an RKO. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I I didn't even think of that. I I think they're going to pull something similar to what they did with Styles versus Orton in March, where they set up the camera, they set up the spot, and they fake us out a little bit. Oh, man. I didn't didn't even think of that. Kinshasa into the RKO. Oh, my God. I can't imagine how they would pull that off. That's crazy. All right. Oh, something else? Randy hears voices in his head while Nakamura hears voices in the crowd (laughs) during their entrances. Right. Oh, that's good. Um, All right. So my no please for this week is a question. 
and Satch, since Raw, Vince McMahon, and Triple H are not here, I'll pose my question to you. Oh, no. It's not the, the, the one I'm thinking of, is it? The I hope not. Okay, thank God. Right. I didn't want to do that on the air. <laughs> yeah. Yo, shut up, Zach. All right. Uh, my question to you is, why does Raw hate Sasha Banks? Why does WWE hate Sasha Banks? I mean, listen, Sasha Banks is... She's great, man. She's great. She's really good, if not great. And the fact that she keeps... Having these short title reigns is just a kick in the butt, man. Like she, <clears throat> they they pointed out last week and this week on TV that she has never successfully defended her title. That she keeps having these two week title reigns, <clears throat> and then That's what true. do they do? They beat her in the first defense of her title. I mean, like. That's just screaming that you don't deserve a champion. You're not quite a champion. You know, they had Alexa go out, say she was going to beat her, and then beat her clean in the middle of the ring. No cheating, no nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And given the way that what happened after the match, I don't even think Sasha's going to get a rematch. So, you know, it just it looks like they just don't have big plans for Sasha right now. And my question is why? Ah, uh, this is this is tough because Sasha should have gotten a real title reign at some point. What, right. She is a four-time champion, right? Right. I think that was the fourth time, and she's lost it on each of the rematches. She deserves, and it's, I feel like the WWE, Raw's women's division only knows how to book one woman at a time. Mm -hmm. Like, we saw it with Charlotte, and now we're seeing it with Alexa Bliss. They only know how to book the top heel woman on the roster, and then everybody else just floats in and out when they need to sh shake things up, in air right. quotes, for a week or two. Sasha deserve will never be able to see what Sasha can do until they give her a real multi-month title reign. And that's something that really could have injected some more energy into the women's division because we haven't seen Sasha go around month after month and defend the title. And your challengers are already lined up. Alexa, Nia Jax... Uh, I guess Emma and then Mickey James on one of the months maybe a multi-person match like she could have been the, the champion into the fall right she definitely could have and now you know I'm not sure where this is going I think I know where I'd like it to go but we'll come back to that alright Satch so we heard what you like we heard what you didn't like but like any good TV show it's all about hope right habit and hope that's why we still watch wrestling let's be honest right we have a habit of watching it and we hope we're going to see something great so what's getting your hopes up what do you see in WWE that's making you say please please show me this Terrence I'm going to give you a question how many Hell in a Cell matches <clears throat> have we had how in many WWE hell? history? Oh my God! Oh, whew. let me just throw a number out there. It's a uh, number between twenty-five and twenty-seven. Oh, yeah, uh, twenty-six. Yes, we've oh, had that was hard. twenty-six <laughs> Hell in a Cell matches. Okay, and we've never had a tag team Hell in a Cell. <laughs> wow! And that that is my please, please that I want to see from the Usos and the New Day. Oh. So on SmackDown this week, the Usos and the New Day. Kofi and Biggie, since Xavier got hurt over the weekend, the Usos, Usos and the New Day had a match to decide who gets to name the stipulation for their next match. Uh -huh. And what's the title of our next pay per view? Hell in a Cell. And what type of tag team? Well, and what type of match do I want to see for this one? I want to see the Usos name their stipulation as Hell in a Cell. Oh because God. these are the two best teams in WWE right now. Mm -hmm. This feud has been red hot, and mm -hmm. the situation we haven't seen these two in that they have both earned is a Hell in a Cell match. Oh my God. Yo, I feel like that would be so amazing. That would be so amazing, dude. The Usos in the New Days always have great matches. Always. And some really brutal-looking near falls, too. Yes, yes. My question and also fear would be, is somebody going to do something crazy like a dive off the top of the cage or, like, 
you know, where the Usos are going to open the top of the cage and do their splash down into the ring. Ooh, or, I can actually imagine that too. Oh man, something wild. So I, I, I want to see this. I would love. So that's a great idea. I would love, love, love to see this. I just am skeptical about how injured somebody would get during this match. But that's an awesome idea, Satch. I love that. And another benefit of this... Okay, another benefit... Two benefits of naming this as their match. One, you can see the promos ramp up to, like, a final level there. Like, either I'm going to end you or you're going to end me. Right. Playing into the injury subtext. Uh And the other one is that... You could sort of write the other team out with injury for the next month. That's true. To, like, bring so in I a new challenger. Break. And then bring them back in a, I guess, what, it, what would come after that? Survivor Series TLC? Uh-huh. And uh-huh. then bring them back in and do whatever else. This feud has been the best part of SmackDown the last few months. 100%. And I feel like it deserves a proper ending. And you know what? They should give these guys the main event spot. Stop treating this as filler on SmackDown because it's the best thing on SmackDown. I would rather see this main... I'd rather see a Hell in a Cell, Usos New Day main event Hell mm-hmm. in a Cell as opposed to a Jinder Nakamura rematch. As opposed to a Jinder Nakamura anything. <laughs> Let's be honest. Jinder and Nakamura have playing words with friends. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody, I, it's just not interesting. But the reason, the number one reason why a, a tag team Hell in the Cell would be perfect for this feud is because that cell would be in the Uso Penitentiary. Ooh. Oh, that's one of your jokes. That's okay. <laughs> uh, hey, it's not paranoid. It's the Usos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, my please, please is a little callback to the main event on Monday Night Raw, which was them stealing the title away from Boo, Sasha Banks, and giving it to Short Boo. <laughs> Alexa Bliss and uh, at the end she was given the old Randy Orton Batista treatment Ooh. by Big Boo <laughs> <laughs> Nia Jax um, and listen my please please this week is please please give Nia a chance give Nia a chance listen I think this might be what the Raw Women's Division needs. I've been saying this for weeks, that Nia has earned the right to be in a prime spot. And they keep stopping and starting with the Nia Jax push into the main event, the Nia Jax, Alexa Butte, Bliss feud, on again, off again, frenemy thing. They keep stopping and starting with this. And just go with it. Like, Nia Jax is the perfect champion for Raw because she's dominant over all the other women. She is a believable champion. And by having a dominant, believable champion, you can stop playing hot potato with the title. You can put that title on Nia Jax and reasonably leave it there until WrestleMania. Yeah, I could definitely buy her as the champion heading into WrestleMania. She can feud and feud and feud with people until she meets Asuka. Ooh. Woo! That's called booking, baby. Book it. Yo, listen. Put, put it on Nia Jax, man. Put it on Nia Jax. Let her destroy any and all challengers until she meets nobody is ready for Asuka. I love it. I'm oh. telling you. Do it. I want to see this now. I'm telling you, man, like that, 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 that's that's the way to go. I want to see this. I'm just worried Raw's gonna screw up Asuka. You, oh my God, dude! When I heard, okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so that, that's that's my please, 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 please give Nia a chance. All right, so now we're going to <clears throat> go on, go off the off the grid a little bit, and <clears throat> we're going to talk about some of the big news things that happened this past week. One of which was the news that Asuka will be vacating the women's title. And how did you feel about that? All right. I thought that this was perfect timing with the Mae Young tournament, that you can get the title, that you can, that with Asuka relinquishing the title, you can put the title on somebody else without her having to lose. However, I do think, had she lost on 
What was that? A last man, last woman standing match, or mm. with? Was this a regular match? Just a regular match. I feel like if she had lost to somebody like Ember Moon or even Nikki Cross in Sanity, it would have put put that person over huge as the one that beat Asuka. So, Asuka's here's a fun fact. Asuka's title reign was longer than CM Punk's. Her unbeaten streak streak was longer than Goldberg's, and she has the lo- a long l- the longest title reign in NXT history. Wow. So yeah, she racked up a lot of accolades. I think a loss in NXT would have put someone over huge, but I think her carrying the unbeaten streak into Raw or possibly SmackDown is still going to be a huge feather if the audience knows who she is from NXT. Mm, that you know what? And see, I think that is that's a great point, Sash, man. That is a great, great point. And I think that's where uh, so many of the NXT talents fall flat when it comes to the main roster because Vince will be impressed by the crowd reaction. And I think Vince is not quite sure what to make of NXT, right? Like, <clears throat> I'm not sure that Vince can necessarily tell when someone is going to, you know, uh, succeed or someone's going to flop when they come from NXT because of look at the mixed results. Personally, I think that the what decides whether or not someone's going to fly or flop when they come from NXT is whether or not they truly have the experience of working a crowd. And for that reason, I think Asuka will be fine. If you look at the nuance of Asuka, she is amazing. She has so many facial expressions and the body language is just so good, man. Like she draws you into whatever she's trying to convey that she's into it. And her ring work looks brutal and you're going to be into that once you see it. And it, it's 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 just it's hard to explain but she is she has the charisma she has the presence she has that it factor and her english might not be the best but everything else about her is amazing it's amazing dude like again she owns the ring when she's in it she owns the stage when she's on it she owns the aisle when she's walking down it she she has it, man. And I think she's going to be fine. I think she's going to be great. The only thing that can stop her is Vince McMahon, <laughs> right? I mean, like, let's be honest, is that if he's not into it, if he's not feeling it, if he decides that, you know, her music's too slow or her music's too fast or... Or she needs a dancing gimmick. Right, right, right. Or she would look better in a miniskirt, right? Like, I mean, like, whatever it is that... You know, whatever little quirks. I I heard uh, Seth Rollins talking about, you know, why they switched up his music. And he said... Seth Rollins would look better in a miniskirt? No, that wasn't it. But he said he just showed up to work one day and somebody grabs him, pulls him to the side and goes, Vince hates the pause in your music. And so they had a bunch of little audio things they wanted to put on there to try and eliminate the pause in his music. Because Vince just woke up one morning and decided he hated it. And... Again, this is the type of stuff that these people have to deal with. This type of stuff that the, that the crowd has to deal with. So Vince wakes up one morning, doesn't like something, and decides he wants to burn it yeah. down. <laughs> you couldn't resist it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that seems like such a random addition to Seth Rollins' theme song. Ooh, crazy, man. Freaking crazy. You know, the first time they did it, I thought it was just a, a fan sitting next to the, one of the crowd mics just yelling really loud. <laughs> That's probably how they recorded it. They were like, oh, God, we got to fix this. Okay, uh, 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 come here. Yell into this mic. Burn it down. <laughs> and it's recorded. It just threw it over Seth Rollins' music. So, I mean, uh, hopefully that type of, you know, fickle decision-making does not ruin Asuka because she's an amazing talent. She's an amazing talent. Um, the big loser here, in my opinion, is Ember Moon because I thought there was a great story to be told with Ember Moon battling her way 
into a victory over Asuka, you know, taking several tries and really gaining the crowd support as she fights her way into that position. And then Asuka doing the honors on the way out. I thought that would have been great, a great boost for Ember Moon. Um, so she's the one who I think loses in that situation. You know, if Asuka hadn't gotten injured, what would have been? I mean, I'm sure you're going to have people going on the podcast circuit later this year or in a, few, in a little while talking about this. If Asuka doesn't get injured, what was the final play? for her that's a great question man we'll never know mm. right we'll never know but uh you know yeah so what else was big from the week of wrestling what else is on on your mind from the wrestling world this week all right well terrence i've got a lot of things on my mind because i am no dummy dummy yeah <laughs> so i caught impact last week the 20 man gauntlet uh-huh. and eli drake is the new Impact champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, no. He's the Global Force Wrestling Global Champion. Global Force Wrestling Global Champion. Yes. <laughs> so, and you know, all right. So I'm jumping back into Impact after a little bit of time away. Uh-huh. And this just sent me down a huge rabbit hole of Eli Drake clips. Oh, my God. And he is, right now, he is my favorite on the roster. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. it feels like. Well, for one, he got his name over. Uh-huh. Right, crowd. right. You know, seriously. Like, you got to think, when they first brought this guy in, you know, like, they come up with a name for him. And like, hey, what, what am I supposed to do with this? And, uh, you know, one day he just, he says, screw it, Eli Drake. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say Eli Drake and just get it over like that. And it worked. And he feels, he feels like the, like somebody who has it. Like, he is like he is completely in tune with his character. He is getting stuff over and I care whenever I see him on the screen. Yeah, I mean listen, I I, I totally agree with you, Sash. I was, you know, taking a look at, you know, what does GFW have to offer, right? You know, how do they present themselves as something that people want to see? And like we talked about earlier, wrestling fans love new, right? And so I was trying to think you know, who are the guys that you would look at on that roster and be the people that you build around for the future? Because you need, like, a package of guys that you think of as that company's guys. Like, I'm sure, you know, if you were to look at ROH, there's, like, a certain group of guys that you look at and be like, okay, these are the ROH guys, or these are the New Japan guys. These are the guys who really signify WWE, right? And I was thinking, who are these guys for, uh, for GFW to build around? And the important qualifications for that, right, would have to be uh, hopefully they'd, they'd be a young talent, somebody that can be there for a while. Um, but most importantly is that there's someone who the audience does not readily identify as a WWE washout or like a WWE failure. Because you could take, you know, Ken Anderson and give him the title for 100 days in a row, people are still going to see him as Mr. Kennedy. Right. Like he's still doing the Mr. Kennedy gimmick and people he's just always going to be that to the audience. And so it's important for GFW to look at their roster and say, who are the guys that we could build around? So I thought about that. And the guys I came up with were obviously EC3, uh, Moose and Eli Drake. And then, you know, probably if you keep going, you could probably say maybe Eddie Edwards, Lashley, you know, those probably be the five guys who I think really represent your GFW package, right? Your GFW brand. Even though Lashley was in some big spots in WWE, he's arguably had way, way, way more success in, you know, TNA, Impact, whatever. He's really blossomed into a complete performer. Right, right, 100%. Like, he's good now. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think Eli Drake is a great guy for them to position as the leader of the new school. Um, I heard somebody say this, and I don't remember who has said it, but I'm just going to echo it because I think it's absolutely correct. Bobby Roode is the longest reigning Impact champion. I think his reign is 256 days. Eli Drake should be the guy to break that record. Eli Drake oh. should have this title. He should carry it on. And uh, if you listen later in the show, you'll hear what I think should be the main event for their next big pay-per-view coming up. And obviously, it features Eli Drake. And I will give you a fun fact. What you got? So the current AAA champion, the current NOAA champion, and the current Global Force champion, of course, all appear on Impact. That's pretty dope. Johnny Impact is the current AAA champion. Eddie Edwards just became the first foreigner to win the NOAA championship. 
And of course, Eli Drake has has his home on impact because he ain't no dummy. <laughs> Yo, I think that's actually really dope, man. I, I, turns, think, I think the worst thing you did was probably turning me on to Eli because now I'm just going to keep making dummy jokes <laughs> every week on this show. He used to have a segment where he would have, remember Staples had the easy button? Oh, yeah. He used to have a segment on the show where he had a dummy button. Where he would hit the button and would go, dummy, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, he might have to bring that back. That was really good. Um, as a matter of fact, I wish he sold that. I would definitely get one of those. <laughs> dummy, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, man. Uh, all right, Satch. Uh, anything else stewing on your mind this week? Um, you guys can uh, catch You guys can catch me on social media at Satch and Dave C. If you've got any good trivia questions or any questions that you want to ask the host, just tweet them at us, at Satch and Dave C. Holla. <laughs> GFW was making news this week for sure. Um, a lot of it centered around their new champion, Mr. E. Lie Drake. He was on the conference call this week with Chris Adonis, and he was, you know, having the, the show this week was centered around his celebration of being the new champion and also who would be his first challenger. That was kind of the plot. Of, of, of the on TV uh, storylines this week. Um, outside of that, though, there was a, 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 little, a little sound blur dropped by Josh Matthews and Jeremy Borash during the broadcast this week that the Global Wrestling Network is going to be available starting in this month, September. So I think that's actually pretty big news. Now, they said, you know, a few vague details. You know, they said there would be episodes of Impact available and some other stuff. But I don't know that, you know, old episodes of TNA Impact is what's going to really push people to pay a monthly subscription fee. Listen, for the average person, we're getting nickel and dime for all these little subscription fees, you know, $10 here, $15 there. And so we're going to start being a lot more discerning as to which little $10, $5, $15 subscription we're going to sign up for. I said all that just to say whatever GFW is offering in this subscription package is going to have to make it worth the, the cost, no matter what the cost is. And I, I just think it's, it's time for us as fans to kind of have an idea of what it is we would like to have from this over the top uh, subscription streaming service. Um, for me, I think WWE has killed the pay-per-view market with the WWE Network. You know, essentially, you give your $9.99 every month, and what you have is you have an almost seemingly unlimited wrestling content library, and you get all of what used to be called pay-per-views. You get all of those for 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 the cost of your $9.99, and this includes, you know, big events like WrestleMania and SummerSlam and the Royal Rumble. Like, these are staples of the wrestling year, and they're all included for your $9.99. So, anytime a company is going to ask you to go in your pocket and pay $40, $50, $60 for a one night of a show, it better be a damn good show, and there better be something in that show that is, you know, newsworthy, something you're going to be able to talk about with your friends. Um... And that's hard to create. That's really hard to create. So what GFW would be wise to do is put their pay-per-views, you know, make them available as part of a subscription to this app because, you know, every pay-per-view they got coming up, you know, I, I'm finished buying, you know, Impact GFW pay-per-views just for the sake of supporting. I'm finished with that because at this point it just costs the, you know, I mean, listen, 60 bucks is not. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like it's not breaking the bank, but it's, you know, like that, that's that's money. You can fill up your gas tank a couple of times with that. So 
I don't know. I just need to see value for any time you're asking me for money for a pay-per-view. And you could truly create value by offering it as part of your subscription service. So I'm interested to see what exactly is going to be available on this prescription uh, prescription subscription service. I think another thing that they could really add is some some events, some live events uh, broadcast from some of their global partners. Um, let's say if they were going to, um, you know, if, if they were going to a big event being put on by Noah, or if they were going to a big event being put on by AAA, you know, broadcast that stuff on the network. Let us, let us see that stuff. I think those are things that actually add value and they increasingly add to the, you know, the perception of GFW as a global wrestling brand. I think that's definitely the way to go, right? Because you're not going to out WWE, WWE, right? So if you can continue to build this concept that your, your brand is a partnership of, uh, you know, wrestling promotions all over the world, I think that's a great and somewhat unique way to go. Um, Along those lines, we got news this week that Eddie Edwards won the world championship in pro wrestling Noah. So congratulations to Eddie Edwards on that. Um, We also got John Morrison, uh, a.k.a. Johnny Mundo, a.k.a. Johnny Impact, debuting on Impact this week. And he's the current AAA mega champion, I believe. And... I just think it'd be really cool if we could get some sort of event where we have the GFW champion, the AAA champion, and the Pro Wrestling Noah champion all on the same card, all doing something. Um, If, you know, if Jeff Jarrett was really smart, he tried to finagle a way to get some sort of match where Eli Drake ends up walking away with all three of those titles because that really puts your promotion over as being, you know, top, right? Um, But it remains to be seen what's to come of those of, of those partnerships of those promotions and of the the app right the over the top streaming service you know I'm definitely interested to see where where it's gonna go what it's gonna look like and and what's gonna be the advantage for us fans um, what can you do to get my money because I'm not gonna sign up for it just because it's coming out so let's see where that goes. <clears throat> Um, a few things I like from the show this week, the Taryn Terrell Alley segment. I really, really like that, man. I really like that. Uh, you know, Allie has this naive thing that she does when she's talking to people. And, you know, I, I didn't even really know that I, that I I'm not gonna say I don't like Allie. I do like Allie, but this kind of was just it made you realize how annoying she can kind of seem, right? Because she's being so nice to Taryn. She's like, oh, you and Gail, best friends, blah, 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 blah. And Taryn's was like, hey, can you give her a message for me? He just starts whooping on her. <laughs> I'm like, okay, listen, um, I think we all know somebody at our job that we would like to do that to. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that was actually a good segment. You know, it definitely made Taryn seem like a bad guy. Uh, and... That led to a little something with Ali and Braxton and uh, Garza Jr., one of my favorites, backstage later in the in the night. Now, <clears throat> speaking of Braxton Sutter, uh, <clears throat> as Ali is backstage, you know, putting ice on her head from her beatdown from Terrence Rowe, Garza Jr. comes around the corner and he's like, hey, are you okay? And Braxton Sutter's like getting in his face about it. And I so... They've been teasing some sort of a breakup between Allie and Braxton Sutter. And I wasn't sure how I felt about the concept because, you know, Allie just has this sweetheart thing going on that everybody, you know, everybody really likes. Everybody loves her. And and that that's her thing. And people love it because she gets a reaction out of each and every crowd she's in front of, you know, out of the U.S. crowd, out of the India crowd. You know, people like Allie. And the idea of doing some sort of split up between her and Braxton Sutter. Uh, it just, it seems weird because it seems like they also just got together, but in reality, it's not like they've been doing anything with them, right? They haven't, they haven't been doing anything. Braxton Sutter seems like a guy that has some potential, but he hasn't been doing anything, right? So, you know, you got to have some sort of character development and this is at least a step in that direction. So I'm interested to see where that goes. All right. Let's see. What else did we? Oh, my God. Okay. So if there was one thing on this show that gave me a gut belly laugh, it was the segment between Grado, 
Laurel Van Ness, and um, Joseph Park, right? So last week when Laurel Van Ness did the proposal to Grado, I think a lot of us were like, didn't Laurel Van Ness just do a wedding? How is she going to jump back into a wedding already? And so I think we all had kind of had a little bit of a pause about that. So when we join this group backstage, they're going through wedding plans, right? Joseph Park is like the marriage counselor and he's talking them through, you know, hey guys, you know, let's talk about the details of your wedding. They're talking about picking a DJ. And uh, Laurel says all her family has to fly in from Victoria or something like that. And he's like, uh, Victoria, Texas? And she's like, no, Victoria, Canada. And at that point, Grado realizes that Laurel Van Ness is Canadian. And so he can't get a green card by marrying her. And he just had this shocked look on his face. And it was just the funniest thing, man. You know, I got to give GFW credit. A lot of these segments that I am thinking I just don't want to see on my wrestling show, they turn out to have some pretty funny payoffs. So, uh, yeah, that was good. I really, really enjoyed that. All right. So that was a few quick takeaways that I I like from GFW this week. Interesting news and notes. And now let's just talk about, you know, things that really, really stood out in a positive way, things that stood out in a negative way, and things that I'm kind of hoping to see. Now, we do that with a little segment I like to call Yes, Please, No, Please, and Please, Please. All right. So my Yes, Please for GFW this week. It's for the, the the Lashley American Top Team storyline. I like the way this is playing out, man. You know, I saw some people talking about this when it first came about around Bound for Glory, that this might be a real thing. And listen, for all we know, there could really be some conversations that he's having with his, uh, with his, his personal confidants, uh, his business managers, and all those people about whether or not to do MMA full-time or wrestling full-time. But... I, but listen, anytime something appears on wrestling TV, it's there for the sake of storyline. It's there for entertainment. And that's kind of how this came off to me from, from the beginning. I had a feeling that this was going to be the story they were telling, uh, that you know he was going to be torn between these two, and he would start having failures as a wrestler, and that would increase the noise coming from the MMA side about what he should be doing. And so this week... He started with uh, a sit-down kind of interview where he had his American Top Team guys there with him, and he pretty much said that he doesn't feel like he has to make a choice right now. You know, he feels like he can still do both, and he was sitting there with Dan Lambert, and Dan Lambert says, you know, you've been having your ups and downs, but if you would just focus on MMA, you would only have ups, Uh, you know, and he, he also noted that it, referring to the dust up that happened backstage between, you know, Jeff Jarrett, James Storm and all those American top team guys. Uh, Dan Lambert said he wasn't going to tolerate Jeff Jarrett's disrespect. So that's interesting, right? He's taking a little bit of a more aggressive tone there uh, before those guys just seemed like they were kind of neutral. And now uh, Dan Lambert is almost playing a little bit of a villain role right there. Um, later in the night, after the main event, the American top team. Now, you know, they've had they've had uh, altercations with referees like the past two weeks in a row. And this week after the main event, they actually came out to ringside and they looked like they were going to dive in and try to attack everybody in the ring. And Jim Cornette actually came down and stopped it. He told Lashley that, you know, if he if he if he got into the ring that he was going to strip him of his opportunity to go to uh, compete for the AAA championship. So that actually, uh, you know, that, that, that called off whatever was going to happen between those guys right there. But I like how this is developing. You know, I think ultimately this is leading to some sort of confrontation between, you know, maybe some combination of, you know, Jeff Jarrett and Dan Lambert and Lashley. And uh, there was another guy um, and uh, James Storm. Like, I think all these guys are going to end up being involved in a match. Otherwise, why else would they be doing this? But this is an interesting way to kind of get a few more celebrity eyes on this by getting people from the MMA world involved. So I'm pretty sure they will be... Uh, you know, by the time Bound for Glory comes around, we'll have some sort of match 
that's uh, designed to draw eyeballs from the MMA world um, to the impact zone for, uh, for for this match. So I like the way this is developing, and I think it's actually very smart. If you look back to the way everything played out, played out with the use of D'Angelo Williams, I got to say that was a win. It was very positive. It got a lot of positive coverage, and he ended up looking good in the ring. And that's probably the most important thing. Everybody came out of that looking good. So Lashley, American top team, the the which way is he going to go? This storyline gets my yes, please. All right. So I told you what I liked. Now, it can't all be winners, right? It can't, it can't all be aces. Uh, you're also going to have some misses, right? You're going to have some things you didn't like. Now, here's the kicker, though. This show had a lot of good stuff. This was another show that I didn't see something right away that made me say, yeah, I really didn't like that. And so they'll always give you something and they always have something there, the tried and true. And rather than tell you what it is, I'm going to play something for you. Okay. Um, I'm going to play for you the worst sound in the wrestling world. And my apologies in advance, because this is pretty brutal. And maybe you shouldn't have to sit through this. But if I do, then you do. So, yeah, check this out. America's top team, and especially Dan Lambert, who I like to call Lambert the Leech. They're screwing Bobby Lashley's head up. Uh-huh. Bobby Lashley is one of the most dominant athletes in any combat sport on this planet. <laughs> but he's listening to the wrong people. He can make a lot more money, be a lot bigger star, and be a lot happier by himself in professional wrestling instead of letting somebody like Lambert and the rest of their thugs ride on his coattail. Do you know what we do for a living? No, no, I don't give a I don't give a <laughs> I feel bad for Bobby Lashley, but he's got to recognize that he's in charge of his own destiny. He needs to pick the right people that he associates with. And America's top team, and Lambert in particular, I'm sick and tired of them going places they shouldn't go in our arena. <laughs> What is your problem, dude? Come here. 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 Come so that is one of the top storylines they have going on this show right now. And you could not miss the shrill shrieking sound, the worst sound in professional wrestling, Karen Jarrett's voice. Oh my God. Oh my God. It, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say, right? I mean, like, it's just, why is she on TV? Why? What does she add? Is anybody out there, if you're a GFW fan, okay, if you're listening to this, then you probably are some level of a GFW fan. So somebody please tell me, what does Karen Jarrett add to the show? What does she make better? Because everything she's in seems to be worst. Except for, I right, listen, I said a few weeks ago when they did that video where she was, you know, talking about Camp Boggy Creek and that type of stuff. I thought she was excellent in that role, right? And so they need to find more stuff to do where they can use her like that. But anything that involves talking or even worse, yelling and screaming, no, no, no. Oh my God, it, it, it's it's just it's just it's awful, it's awful. I, I mean, my God, I, I just, there's there's not enough words 
to say how much I would never want to hear Karen Jarrett's voice again. It's just, it's just, it's just not good. I mean, like I said, otherwise the show was great, but. Karen Jarrett screaming all over the top storyline on the show or the second and top storyline in the show. You get my no, please. All right. So we talked about what I like. We talked about what I didn't like. But in any TV show you like, you always have a hope for what you want to see, right? You see some things that kind of lead you in a certain direction and you kind of think, Man, I really hope you guys do this. As a matter of fact, please, please do this. And so my please, please this week is for is please, please do Eli Drake versus Johnny Impact at Bound for Glory. I think that needs to be the main event of this show. Uh, Eli Drake versus Johnny Mundo or excuse me, Johnny Impact is a match that I don't think anyone has ever seen before, so that'll be an exclusive match. You got a guy who's established and has a name, and you got a guy who is being built up as you know one of your top brand guys, and it, he needs to beat Johnny Impact. It doesn't matter if he beats him, you know, convincingly. It doesn't matter if he beats him, you know, in a sneaky uh, chicken s heel kind of way, but. Eli Drake needs to beat Johnny Impact at Bound for Glory. I think that's a main event you can sell because people haven't seen it. And I think you guys got to do a good job building up to create this uh, create this, this main event. Um, the main event of this particular show looked like it might be leading us in that direction. You had uh, Johnny Impact and Eddie Edwards as a tag team going against Chris Adonis and Eli Drake as a tag team. Now, the stipulation here was if Johnny Impact or Eddie Edwards got the pinfall, then one of them would be the next challenger for Eli Drake's title. Now, this match was done perfectly because the two people that came out of this looking the best was... Johnny Impact and Eli Drake. Johnny Impact did a lot of his cool parkour style moves throughout the match. He definitely kind of was the star of that match. And Eli Drake ended up getting the deciding pinfall. So I thought that was great, right? You're accomplishing your goal. You got two people that you're trying to build up to eventually, you know, meet in a big match. And they both came out of this match looking great. So that's great. That's a great job on whoever put that match together. Um, and I think this really planted the seeds for what can be a big main event between Eli Drake and Johnny Impact. You know, I think both these guys just need to keep looking like a big deal going forward. And then eventually you make the match. Um, I mentioned that the stipulation for the tag team match was that, you know, uh, if Eddie Edwards or Johnny Impact got the pin, then one of them would get the title shot, and Eli Drake ended up getting the pin, so neither one of them gets the title shot. Uh, what Jim Cornette did after the match is he came down and announced that Eli Drake would actually be defending his title next week against Matt Seidel. I like the match. I like the matchup. Matt Seidel's coming off a big win against Lashley, so he has you know some credibility that he's carrying right now, and Eli Drake... He's not quite a gender Mahal in the sense that no one, you know, believes that he belongs in the spot. And that's no disrespect to gender Mahal. I just that's just the feeling that I get from talking to people about gender Mahal. Um but Eli Drake is not in that position, but he is in the position where I think people are excited about what he can possibly do, but now he has to actually do it because he has the title. He's the feature guy. He needs to do something each and every week that makes us go talk to our friends about it and makes us say, I need to, you know, come back and see what he's going to do next. So the pressure's on. But I think Eli Drake has, you know, all the tools to be that guy, to be something that makes impact, you know, destination viewing, must see TV type of thing. And so, uh, yeah, I think this could be a great main event for Bound for Glory. There's no reason not to do it. And. At the end of the day, I think they'll give you a great match. So, you know, all you guys got to do is build me a good story that has me interested, and you can have my 60 bucks for Bound for Glory. So, uh, Eli Drake versus Johnny Impact, you get my please, please. All right, guys, that is my Impact review for this week. Uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure you hit like 
and subscribe to the channel. And yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe this is what you call over delivering. All right. The podcast was a little bit late last week, but what did I do instead? I gave you two quality shows this week to rock with. So if you guys are liking the content, I hope you're loving the content. If you're not, I want you to tell me why. Tweet me at TW Talking About and let me know. Hit me up on Facebook. Hit me up on Twitter, uh, you know, and, and, and let me know, you know, why I'm not your favorite podcast. I mean, look, I know some places you can go, you can get celebrity interviews and that type of thing. But I always find talking about wrestling is the most fun when I'm talking with, you know, my 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 friends who are wrestling fans who are, you know, not completely lost in, you know, what's reality and what's not. Uh, but we all want to get a little bit lost in what's real and what's not because that's what that's what makes wrestling fun. You know, that is, was and always will be when wrestling is the best, when the lines are blurred between what's real and what's not. So, you know. Let's not point our fingers at the people who can't tell the difference a little too much. All right. Um, But that's our show for this week. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter at TW Talking About. You can uh, like my blog page on Facebook. It's at Swag on Blast. Check out the blog. That's where I post um, all of these podcasts. You can check them out there. If you listen on SoundCloud, Hit that follow button so you know whenever my new tracks post. And most importantly, tell a friend to tell a friend. If you like what you're hearing, share it on a friend's page. Uh, Tag somebody in the comments. And let's keep the conversation going. Thank you guys so much for all your support. And we'll see you next week. My aunt said I got the cutting edge. So I guess it's only right I take a decade, a decade. Then it's four more years. Then it's Kanye West for president. You know that I'm a man with it. Shouldn't have to say it twice You don't have to love me You just gotta act right